Welcome, everybody, both in the room and online. Uh, my name is Melissa Begg, and it's my great honor to serve as Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. Uh, delighted that you joined us today. Um, we have a terrific speaker, uh, Dr. Leo Cabasa. He is going to deliver the uh, Hyman and Sophie Grossbard Lecture in Psychotherapy and Social Work Practice. Now, the Hyman and Sophie Grossbard Lecture honors two committed graduates of the Columbia School of Social Work, and it focuses on addressing and advancing the understanding and knowledge base for direct practice and clinical social work. And we're thrilled that Dr. Cabasa agreed to give this lecture today. I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, for our community to come together uh, and hear from Dr. Cabasa and better understand the impact of serious mental illness and health inequities. So now I have the honor of introducing uh, tonight's moderator, my amazing colleague, Dr. Ana Abreiro Lanza. Dr. Abreiro Lanza is a professor of social work and vice dean of Columbia School of Social Work. She's a scientist who is cross trained in the social sciences and public health, a leading scholar in Latinx health and behavioral, behavioral science, an innovator in curriculum development, and an effective advocate for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the academy. Now, Dr. Abreiro Lanza was uh, formerly on the Columbia faculty for a long time, I think 98 through 2018. Does that sound right? Um, and then she left to pursue a senior administrative leadership role at NYU, but we dragged her back. Uh, while she was at NYU, she maintained an active program of research focusing on cultural, psychosocial, and structural factors that affect the health of Latinos, and in particular, how ethnicity and culture, in particular, acculturation processes, relate to health beliefs and behaviors. And a major focus of Dr. Abri Lanza's research is on analyzing the disparities between Latino and non-Latino whites in the U.S. and exploring key cultural, social, and individual factors that promote health. Notably, her work on the Latino health paradox is very well known. Furthermore, she's maintained a deep commitment to recruiting and retaining diverse folks in the academy, uh, faculty and students alike. Uh, and she works closely now, I know, with our provost's office on diversity initiatives and also as a member of the President's Commission uh, investigating the history of racism at Columbia University. She's a great colleague uh, and a great leader and so lucky to have her on our faculty. So, Anna, uh, pleasure to turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. It is my great, great pleasure to introduce this afternoon our esteemed speaker, Dr. Leopoldo Cavasa, also known as Leo Cavasa. Um, Dr. Cavasa is a Puerto Rican social worker. And in addition, he is a professor director of the social work PhD program and the co-director of the Center for Mental Health uh, Services Research at George Warren Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses on physical and mental health inequities in historically marginalized racial and ethnic populations with serious mental illness. And these include, for example, schizophrenia, major depression, and bipolar disorder. His work makes significant contribution in three broad areas. The first is improving depression literacy and reducing stigma towards mental illness in the Latino community. Second, uh, his work reduces physical health disparities in racial ethnic minorities with serious mental illness. And third, his work helps to improve the health and well-being of young adults who are experiencing a first episode psychosis. His very innovative and important work, which blends quantitative and qualitative research health disparities research, community engagement, intervention research, and implementation science has been supported not one, by, but two, by two different NIH institutes, including the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities and the New York State Office of Mental Health and the Rod Woodward Johnson Foundation and by SAMHSA, so it is uh, quite a, a commentary that his innovative work is supported by so many different agencies. Among many honors and awards, Dr. Kawasa is a fellow of the Society for Social Work and Research, 
and the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare. He also currently serves as a member of the NIH Center for Scientific Review Advisory Council. I could say much more and more, but I know we all want to hear about the interesting work that he will uh, speak about this afternoon. So please join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Cavazas. We're so delighted to have you at our school. Thank you, Ana. So, muy buenas tardes. It is great to be in New York. It is great to be at Columbia University. Thank you so much for this great opportunity and to see so great colleagues and friends. And, and it feels, feels like home. This, this is home in some ways for others. Very fitting that I'm doing this at Columbia because today I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've done on a book that we I recently wrote that put all this work together and a lot of this work was done here at New York. It was while I was both at the Department of Psychiatry and the faculty here at the School of Social Work. So it, it, it's fitting that, that the first talk that I do on this, it, it, it's in the place where a lot of this work was done. But I wanna start very quickly by acknowledging that none of this work could have been done without our great team. I am, I am here presenting the work of this group. I am just one person along the entire group of people that we have a collaborator over the years. It, it, I say that social work is a team sport, it's a team science, it's an applied science, but it's the work of all these individuals who've really done the work uh, and put all this together. And this is this is what I love about my work, being able to work with smarter people than I am uh, and, and contribute to this work that we have here. Uh, and I also wanna thank all the great collaborators that I continue to have at the Department of Psychiatry or PI. New York loves their acronyms. These are all acronyms of different centers, I think, but these are continual partners in our work and, and this work actually continues because of them and I learned so much from them. Uh, so what I'm gonna present is over uh, about the past decade, there's been two research questions that have shaped the work that I do uh, and that, that, that our team has engaged with. One is why do people that are living with serious mental illness, things like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, major depression, why are they dying at a much younger age than the rest of the population? And then what is being done to, uh, to address those health inequities? And, and some people consider people with serious mental illness as a marginalized, minoritized community uh, that faces many components. And some of the work will highlight that, but we cannot forget that they also have other identities. They also have identities, other livelihoods, and other things that come into play, and those are very important. Also, this work, to me, this is what happens when you get tenure. You're, you get tenure, and suddenly you're like, okay, what am I going to do now? I wanted to sort of take a new challenge and write about this. We have collected way a lot of information, a lot of cases, a lot of qualitative data that usually doesn't fit in our in our in our academic journals. So to me, it's an opportunity to put this together. And I, as I was writing this, I, it became very clear that my motivation was not only academic or scientific, but very personal. Both chronic diseases and mental illness are familiar experience in my Puerto Rican family. We've lost way too many aunts and uncles and cousins uh, to things like diabetes, cancer, uh, depression, suicide. So these topics that I study are shaped also by my own personal experience, by my own uh, positionality as a Puerto Rican social worker, uh, as someone that comes from a minority community and a community that's been colonized for more than 100 years. So this book to me was a representation of not forgetting where I come from and, and the roots, and that has informed uh, what I've done. I also want to highlight that this gives us an opportunity to blend good, rigorous research, which is what social work needs to do, with also the idea of health equity and bringing those things together and bringing both science and stories to bring to each other. That a good mentor of mine had this beautiful quote that said that the data should never equip, uh, eclipse the humanity. We need to bring those two things together both the data and the stories behind those data. So in today's presentation, I'm gonna tell you some story. I'm gonna present you some data, some things about our randomized control trial, but also stories of people to help us ground that component and the importance of bringing the objective elements of data plus the subjective components of people's experience and bring those together to ground our understanding. Because uh, this population most likely it doesn't get well represented in, in the science that we have, particularly people from Latino backgrounds, from black backgrounds. In this literature, they're silent. So we wanted to bring those voices up. The stories I'm gonna tell you are composite of different people. I'm very respectful of people's privacy uh, uh, and, and names. So, so these are, we have changed 
different things for, uh, to hide their, uh, their identity, but the heart of it and the stories of it are reflective of the lives of these individuals. So let me start by telling you about Carla. Uh, Carla, I first met Carla uh, doing a, some focus groups initially at an outpatient mental health clinic here in New York. Uh, Carla, um, um, Carla was born in the Dominican Republic. She had lived more of her life in New York City. Uh, she spoke Spanish and English, but preferred to talk in Spanish. Uh, and at the time, she was in her at the time of our of our interviews and focus groups. Uh, she was in her mid forties, living alone in, in Upper Manhattan. Uh, her main source of income were with her monthly disability pay, uh, uh, checks, uh, and she suffered from schizophrenia. From I'm sorry, she suffered from schizoaffective disorder and multiple chronic medical conditions, as you can see here. Uh, and part of the work that we were doing at that time was to really talk to people like Carla and ask them, "What are your experiences seeking medical care?" for these conditions? What do you experience? What is your perceptions of that work? And hopefully understand that perception so that it can inform our interventions and our program. And when we asked Carla to talk about her health, this is what she said. I'm sick from head to toe. I have many problems. I have diabetes. I have high blood pressure. My mind is not right either. And I also have really bad arthritis that I had for a long time. What was interesting, it was that Carla was connected to primary care. She went to her doctor. She was taking her medication. Her, her serious mental illness was well treated, but she was struggling with her physical health issues. Uh, she felt that her doctors would never gave her enough time uh, to ask questions. Uh, they, both her psychiatrist and her primary care doctor will tell her the same thing. We're worried about your health. You're gaining weight. You have diabetes. You have high blood pressure. Uh, please take your medication, improve your diet and exercise, but provided her very little support to actually put those things together. Um, and Carla had tried many things to de deal with this, but had uh, something always got in the way and could never sort of get a hold of her entire health. And Carla died about a year after we met from a stroke. Uh, and these are the stories that, that we want to bring together. These are people that are struggling with these issues and our system of care is not helping them. And we're failing them in many ways. But and, and the sad thing here is that we know what to do. We know what services are needed. It's just how to get them into the communities that are most needed. So as you go through, the, through my presentation today, remember Carla, because uh, is this is the people we're trying to help. And, and these are the stories we need to be telling and how to best improve the care uh, of, of, of these uh, populations. So as many of you know, you know, serious mental illness is not a diagnosis. Serious mental illness is actually a combination of mental disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. In fact, every state defines serious mental illness a little bit differently. Uh, it is basically a way of serving people that have, serious, that have mental disorders that interfere with major life activities and results in serious functional limitation. 14.2 million Americans every year live with a serious mental illness. It constitutes five out of the 10 leading causes of disability worldwide but recovery is possible. People can recover from this. People can cope with this disorder with the right supports and the right treatments. One aspect that we have left behind in this population has been their physical health. Why are they dying at a younger age? It is, it is not only because of their mental illness, but it's also because of their cardiovascular disease. They have higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of hypertension and serious um issues with cancer as well. So they are not benefiting from the health condition, the health services that we have in this country to address all of these preventable medical conditions in this population. But when you look at this literature and you examine the intersection of serious mental illness mm -hmm. uh, uh, with minoritized groups, we see a double health burden of disease happening here where Latinx and Blacks uh, with serious mental illness, there's evidence of increased risk compared to non-Hispanic whites of cardiovascular-related mortality, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which is a combination of different components, obesity, and other things. And this literature, actually, there's indications of this double burden, but this literature is very inconclusive. Uh, there are many small studies on this topic, mostly are clinical samples and so not people out in the community, and few analyzers actually look at subgroup differences and gender differences that are really important for this population. So I tell all my doctoral students, early career faculty, 
This is an area that requires a lot of research. There's a lot of field here to examine these inequities and understand what they are and how to improve them. Um, and then COVID hit. And COVID put these individuals at a higher risk for multiple things. Uh, and the United States actually was a little bit behind in identifying people with serious mental illness as a very vulnerable population, as, a, as one of those pre-existing conditions that will put you at risk. So right now we are sort of in this uncertain time where we have this already inequities happening in this population, COVID has hit, and we see like a hurricane brewing on top of a, a major inequity. Uh, and it, it will be uh, important to see what happens to this population as COVID continues and what resources we can provide this, this group. Because we not only do they have existing pre-existing condition, but they're living also in congregate housing in places that puts them at higher risk for many of these components. And these are some examples from the literature that have come out. Actually, in some of it here uh, from Colombia, if I'm not mistaken. So COVID also had that element, but also COVID shows something very important. These are two articles, one for Atul, uh, Atul Goande, uh, which I love as a, as a scientific writer and for other things. And this is also the other one is a article actually in science, but uh, by a social worker and an infectious disease expert, Elvin Gang, that talked about sort of the importance of implementation science in this. And one thing that they come up with is that COVID has shown the world that knowing what to do does not ensure doing what we know. That lack of, we know what we need to do to improve things, but we don't do it uh, for many different reasons. And implementation science is one of the places that can help do it. It's not the only one, but it can help improving that component. Uh, so that has also informed our work and continues to, to bring that component of how do we bring implementation science to address health inequities. And we've been at, the, at that discussion uh, for many years. So great articles to think about. And actually one, Atul Gwanda talks about sort of the lack of testing and, the, and, and we had the technology, we didn't implement it. Uh, and uh, Proctor and, and Gang talk about the importance of having an implementation science of component on everything that we're doing uh, as we're moving science into practice and having practice informed science as well. But in the area that I'm working at, uh, in improving the health of Latinx and Blacks with serious mental illness, there's some critical gaps that continue to this day. And the one that I'm sad to say is that we've, we've published multiple systematic literature review, examining multiple uh, evidence-based approaches for improving the physical health of people with serious mental illness, lifestyle intervention that focus on diet and exercise, peer-led interventions that focus on connecting people with peers, especially people with lived experiences to connect to healthcare, even in smoking cessation, we see this similar component, a stark underrepresentation of racial and ethnic minority groups in the evidence being generated from these trials. And this continues to say we're doing something new now for health promotion and we're seeing the same exact same thing. Uh, and this is a serious component. If we are not including the populations that will benefit most from this intervention, how do we know that the science is really helping them? And I, I believe the science can help them. These are the right interventions, but we do need to include and do better work, uh, including and engaging these populations in the science. And this is a problem. This is a wonderful study that came out of 20,692 US-based trials from 2000 to 2020, examining the representation of minoritized group compared to the US population census. And we see that aside from non-Hispanic whites, there's an over-representation of non-Hispanic whites in these clinical trials. There's a consistent under-representation of Blacks, Latino, Asian, and American Indians in this population. And this is beyond just uh, for serious mental illness. This is for all clinical trials and clinicaltrial.gov uh, that doing this analysis. Really important paper. And we're not catching up. The, 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 we're increasing the numbers of, of minoritized groups in clinical trial, but at the rate that we're going, it's like 1.5% increase every year. We're never gonna get there. So we need to increase the science in this area. And Anna Bauman and I have talked about this in several publications that the ex exclusion of historically underserved communities in clinical trial that create the evidence for our evidence-based practice creates a serious blind spot, not only in that treatment science, which is important, but in moving that science into practice. Uh, and those are components that we're trying to address in our work by doing this type of work with minority community, engaging with them and developing the evidence for those populations. The other big critical gap as we move forward with this, let me make sure I don't run longer here, but love to talk, 
um, is this component that culture, issues of culture and social determinants of health, in, in, and, and I'm talking right now on the literature regarding serious mental illness, are often ignored in this literature. There's sort of this assumption that once you have a serious mental illness, that's the most important thing in your life. Your, your race, your ethnicity, your gender, the reality where you live, your social determinants of your soul disappears. This paper that you see here is one of the best papers there is in my field around the best intervention, both psychosocial intervention and pharmacological intervention for people with serious mental illness. The word race, ethnicity, poverty, racism, culture, appears nowhere in the systematic literature review. Um, and these are by leaders in our field. Uh, so we do need to do a better job here. And why is this important? It's because these factors matter in physical health. They shape our health behaviors, what choices we make by where we live, or the cultures that we have, how we experience and how we communicate our illness experiences. The client provided interactions uh, play a, a role here. And then our clients' interactions with the healthcare system. So that blind spot, we do need to have attention to culture and social determinants of health as we're developing intervention and understanding how to implement them because they, pay, they, play, they, they play a crucial role in all these components. Our work focuses on equity and I wanna uh, sort of, uh, there's this great, this is a great slide from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation of the difference between equality and equity. I am not interested in equality. Equality is giving everything the same, everyone the same thing. And equity forces us to think bigger, to think about what is it that everyone needs. A one size fits all does not achieve equity. We might, we might need to do different things with different people based on their needs, their circumstances, uh, and where they live, as you can see here. And our work focuses on figuring those components, of asking those questions about what is it that this population really needs, what this community needs that may be different from something else. We can learn from different communities but we might need to do different things for different people. And this is tough to, to, to address because this, it requires us to think differently about how we conduct our science and, and, and the type of work that we do. So in our work over the past 10 years, what we have done is we've put this up front in our work and the way that we approach equity, health equity in people with serious mental illness has been to incorporate culture into our intervention, to be very salient and very transparent and bringing culture to the, to the forefront in the type of work that we're doing. Engaging racial and ethnic minoritized populations in our trials, that they're the majority in our studies, not the minorities. Expanding the type of providers who can deliver health interventions. And I put social workers here, because social workers are delivering most of the mental health care in this nation. They should be trained also to deliver healthcare services and be the connectors to care. And there's a, there's a history here of social work doing that. We also work a lot with peer specialists. These are people who have lived experiences of recovering from mental illness, and they also are an important workforce that can deliver the things. I have familiar experience of this, but I've never lived through a serious mental illness. I do not know what that is, but people that have have lots to talk to, uh, talk, teach us about it, and also how to provide better services to this population. And peer specialists are incredibly important workforce for our country. Uh, expanding the settings in which we do this work, not only in the clinic, but go beyond the clinics and, and take these interventions out into the community, supportive housing. And then we're integrating implementation science. So as we're adapting interventions and we're developing, we're always thinking, how will this work in the in, the, in routine practice setting? Or what people like to call the real world, we're all real. So I don't know why we call it that, but routine practice settings. So like, how will that work? If we make things too complicated, in our research, people might not be able to use it. Our, our, our practitioners are not going to be able to use it to think in that component. That way. I also want to highlight that the importance of community engagement is critical. This is a quote from one of the key reports that lays for the United States the importance of addressing health equities in people with serious mental illness. And I completely see this informing our work that our principal partnerships, if we're going to address this, must be with the people that we serve. Uh, and that those are important partners as we're doing this and working with that community, not for that community uh, or, or taking from community. So part of what I'm going to tell you today as we put this call to action is to explain, to, is to provide you examples of how we're putting these principles into action uh, and, and what we have learned and what, what, what questions remain in the field as we move this forward. All right. So as a social worker, we're looking 
for factors that we can change. We're looking for things that our, our treatments, our psychotherapy can, can make a difference. Uh, and these are uh, in, in addressing the health of people with serious mental illness. There's a constellation of factors that influence this from health behaviors all the way through community. So I'm going to give you examples of how we're tackling each of these components one at a time. Well, not one at a time, but you'll see, you'll see what I mean. So we start with medical care. Uh, and this became one of the first studies that I did in New York was this huge qualitative study in Upper Manhattan, uh, really trying to see how are agencies in this community serving the physical health needs of Latinos and Black with serious mental illness? What were the challenges? And we talked to clinicians, administrators, clients, family members, community leaders. We talked to everyone who wanted to talk to us uh, and got an opportunity to see what the major problems were. And this is a quote from one of our administrators talking about the challenges of her Latino clients actually having to navigate between our healthcare system and our mental health care system. Our patients, partly because of their illnesses, their culture, their language issues, because the system is not very, very organized, they often get lost in the system. The patient just gets overwhelmed. You're not feeling well. You have symptoms of psychosis. You don't speak the language and you're trying to figure out what office to go to. It can be overwhelming uh, and they don't get the care that they need. They get lost in this labyrinth. One solution here is to break the labyrinth and destroy, uh, and completely not destroy, well, destroy the labyrinth, but actually rebuild our healthcare system. But if we cannot do that, as social worker, we can help someone navigate that labyrinth back and forth and do it in a, in a way that improves the coordination of care and the fragmentation of care. So that's one of the first call to actions is actually to integrate our integrated models of care, bringing physical and mental health care together should be the norm, not the exception. And our country is working in that component. There's been a decade of, way, of work that SAMHSA has been doing of, of doing this type of work. However, from our work, these models need to consider culture and structural uh, uh, obstacles to care. That a one size fits all of integration is not going to work here. We need to pay very close attention of issues of language, of uh, uh, issues with culture and components of where people live, the structural obstacles that are getting to care. So one of the approaches that we developed, we took this great intervention that Ben Drost uh, developed in Emory University in Atlanta, which is basically taking registered nurses to become healthcare managers. These are people in outpatient mental health services that are focusing on the physical health of their clients and helping them connect to primary care. Well, that to me sounded like a social worker. Why can social workers also do that? Uh, so we began this process of adapting this intervention, which we call Bridges to Better Health and Wellness, to uh, train master level social workers to become that healthcare manager. And healthcare managers here are not really providing any health intervention. All they're doing is bridging, monitoring, and coordinating between the mental health provider and the primary care uh, provider, and then coaching and, and connecting and coordinating services with clients and their support system. This is the person who's in your corner helping you navigate the system and making sure you don't get you don't fall through the cracks. And we adapted that intervention for social workers and for Latinos uh, with serious mental illness. And at that time, it was interesting. I was beginning to do implementation science, uh, and I was very well embedded in the cultural adaptation world. How do we adapt, culturally adapt interventions uh, and things like that? And I wanted to develop a process where we adapt with the community rather than for the community. We wanted to do this process where we engage our stakeholders, the people in on the ground, uh, our clinicians, our peer specialists, our, uh, our administrator, and work with them to adapt this intervention and to make it real for them in their setting. So we developed this approach, which we ended up calling the Collaborative Intervention Planning Framework, which is a nice um, uh, title for this. But what we really did, we took CBPR principles and intervention mapping and blended together and brought those components. CBPR provided us the values. It provided us sort of the principles for putting a partnership together, but then we needed to put that into action and intervention mapping provided us the opportunity to provide that action. And intervention mapping, for those of you who are embedded sort of in public health, this is a, a, a methodology of developing intervention that you start with a needs assessment, a problem analysis, then, then review theory, then you link those theories to the needs and you develop an intervention. And, and I, it has been used to adapt interventions as well. And what I loved about this approach is that I could bring my community advisory board, but then I had a map 
of what are we going to do when we meet? Where are we going to go from step one to step two to step three and build capacity as we're doing that? So that the intervention is not my intervention, it's their intervention. And, and they learn about what they need to do. Uh, so we, we put that into action. And as I said, CBPR provided sort of the partnership and then intervention mapping with the systematic steps and procedures to do that. Uh, and it focused on multiple adaptations. And I just wanted to highlight for today uh, the adaptation that we did culturally. So adaptations to me, when we look at cultural adaptation, there's this great, uh, now it's a dated paper. And, well, I don't like to call it data. It's a good, it's a classic, I guess, is what people call it, which is when we think about cultural relevance, we need to think about two levels. The surface level is to make the, uh, the intervention, uh, matching the intervention materials to the messages, the content of the observable characteristics of the population you're adapting to. In the sense, this is if you're taking an intervention that was in English, translated into Spanish, translated into the right Spanish. So Spanish, and if you're working with Dominicans or Puerto Rican, Caribbean Spanish, if you're working with a population that's Spanish. So being sensitive about the type of language, the literacy level is really important. So making sure that materials are the right literacy level for your population, and then using materials that are relatable to the population that you're working with, that it looks Latino, that it feels Latino, it has a flavor to it that a Latino can look at it, it's like, okay, I, these are my people. But then you have to go deeper than that. Because if you don't, you'll run your intervention into an iceberg. Deeper means thinking very carefully about, about identifying a specific cultural beliefs, values, and preferences that may impact the core elements of your intervention. So in our case, one of the uh, cultural factors that we needed to focus, focus on was how does clients cope and manage with their health issues? What are the cultural elements that come into play there? How do we empower clients to be more active participants in their own healthcare? In the Latino community, it becomes really important because there's this cultural uh, idea of deference to authority. You don't question your doctor. You don't tell your doctor you're, that you don't, you're not going to follow the instructions either. So you say CC to the doctor. Yes, we're going to do this. No problem, doctor. CC to us, whatever. And then you go home and don't take your medicines. Um, so we needed to empower that, no, it's okay to question your doctor. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to, uh, to engage in that process. And then to target specific attitudes and stigma that comes into play with it. So thinking more deeply, not about something at the surface level, but more at the deeper level. Uh, so we did multiple adaptations with this intervention. I'll give you two examples uh, of two things that we did. There's many others as well. But for example, in this intervention, we need to share information between providers, uh, right? Your mental health provider needs to know what your primary care provider is doing. At this time, electronic medical records were being developed. Uh, but what happens is that the uh, electronic medical records from the mental health side do not talk to the medical records on the mental health side. And in our context at Washington Heights, when we did this, people were not just going to one primary care clinic they were going to 19 different types of primary care clinics with everyone with a very different uh, medical record, different system. So we needed to find a way of communicating that information. So we literally use a tool that is for transitional care. So it's basically a personal health record. This is your information that you can share with each of your providers. And within that record, we provided opportunities and coached the patient to ask questions, to be prepared for those visits. What do you need to do before you go to your visit? What, what type of questions do you need to ask your doctor? Let's practice that. Let's model that for you so that when you go there, you become more engaged with that care and you become a driver in the healthcare that you need. Uh, not rocket science here either. This is a, a, a good tool. And literally, we printed this out for people. And we had it in the medical record in the outpatient setting, medical record in primary care, and then the client had one when they moved around. If you lose it, don't worry, we'll print it again. You lose it again, no worry, we'll print it again. Your doctor lost it, we will email it, fax it to you, send you with smoke signal, whatever you need, we'll get you that information. Because that information is power. And information is very important for this uh, type of, of chronic illnesses that we're talking about. In this, in this project, people had serious mental illness. They're Latinos, so all over adults, and they had to have at least one risk factor for cardiovascular disease, which is basically anything under the sun, overweight or obesity, uh, uh, smoking, uh, having blood pressure, high blood pressure, hypertension, 
having a diabetes, high cholesterol, any of those things. And in these clinics, 90% of the clients have those risk factors. Uh, so we also wanted to be very expansive, uh, meaning, meaning uh, that anyone, uh, our, our inclusion criteria were very, very broad to capture everyone in that clinic. The other adaptation comes from some work that we were doing with Roberto Luis Fernandez, which is how do you assess for the cultural aspects of your health? All of these people are well connected, but nobody had asked them, what do you think of your diabetes? Where do you think that comes from? What do you fear most about your hypertension? Uh, what have you done uh, to address uh, your high cholesterol? So having an opportunity for the patient to tell their story in their own words around all of these components was really empowering for them. And in the Latino cultures, asking about your personal life converts this, conveys this value of personalismo. I care for you, not that you're a patient, but that you're a human, a human being. It, it, it conveys warmth, it conveys respect. Even the mere act of asking this question engages the client. And we taught our healthcare managers to do this, not with an iPad, but literally to talk to someone, to ask them, to look them in the eye and ask them this question on top of the health assessment that you're doing. So you're getting both the subject, the objective indicators of health and the subjective indicators of people's stories. Super powerful to making the connection with your healthcare manager. And social workers are great at this if you provide them right training and supervision. So we pilot tested this. It's a small pilot, a 12 month, this is a 12 month intervention. They meet at least once a month with their healthcare manager. Uh, we did structured interviews at based on six and 12 months. And then I, to me, it's really important to hear from people every time we do interventions to hear from every stakeholder, how did that intervention go for you? We have the theories and so, but how, what is the experience of the healthcare manager? What is the experience of those clients that have received our intervention? What did they learn from it? And we tested this in a pilot study. And what we found was that it was feasible to train social workers with the right supervision to be healthcare managers. They were right for, they were already doing this. They didn't have a system to systematize this. So they were really good at doing this. We found that 80% of participants not only completed our study, they completed our intervention. They stay with us. And then we saw significant improvements in patient activation that you're engaging your own healthcare and your self-efficacy, particularly to talk to your doctor. They feel confident about talking and asking to a doctor, which is what we're trying to do and managing their chronic illnesses. And then there's this great measures of patient's assessment of chronic illness care. Basically, it's asking the patient, did your healthcare manager do what they're supposed to do? It's like a fidelity um, indicator from the client's perspective. Uh, and they, we saw increases in that. And then we almost doubled the rate of, re of preventive primary care uh, in this population in, in, in the year that we, that we work with them, which, is, which corresponds with the RCT that Ben did uh, in Atlanta. We're now taking this, the, this project and doing a larger trial in Puerto Rico, and I'll show you later how we are adapting it, but we're moving this into a larger a trial to really test the effectiveness. This was one group design. Uh, we didn't have a comparison condition. We need to test it with that and really improve and see how this works compared to usual care, for example. But qualitatively, what we also learned, what were the key aspects of the healthcare manager? And the best quote that we were able to find is that the healthcare manager, when we asked people about what is it that resonated with you, with your healthcare manager, so the people at the end of our intervention, they say something like, my healthcare manager treated me like I was family, treated me like someone cared. It was in my corner. And they um, reflected critical values of respect, of support, apoyo, individual attention, professionalism, and they instilled a, a, a confianza, hope that things could get better. Remember, Carla had lost hope uh, of the healthcare system, the healthcare manager help restore hope that this that the system can work for you if you have the right person. And so now in the new project that we're doing, we're gonna wanna capture this. This is qualitatively, we're gonna try to have some measures of some of these concepts to see if these are the mechanisms that are the interpersonal mechanisms that are happening uh, with, with the other components. But you do these projects, we look, we increase engagement into care, we increase preventive primary care, no, no one's health improved. They were still diabetic. They were still having high cholesterol. 
they were still, their physical health were not doing better. So we we helped engage and reduce the fragmentation of care, but their health did not improve. And anyone who works in this field was like, yeah, of course, people don't live in the clinics, they live in the community. There are other things that can play into, uh, into role. And one of the components there are health behaviors. So in our next study uh, that, that grew out of this idea, we wanted to say, okay, how do we bring health intervention that focus on ho- those health behaviors, but do it outside outside the clinic walls. So our second call to action is that we need to move interventions into the community outside of the clinic walls where people live. And in that sense, we went to supportive housing agencies. Many people with serious mental illness live in supportive housing agencies. Many have histories of homelessness. So can we bring interventions into those settings? And many of those settings are already struggling with the healthcare of these individuals. Many of those settings uh, serve a, a, a very high risk population for this type of work. And many already employ peer specialists who can deliver some of this care. So we began this partnership uh, with several supported housing agencies uh, here in New York. And this project actually was very fascinating because we could have gone there and just say, here's the intervention that we want to develop. This is what, what you need. And we didn't do that. We'd step back and say, why don't we ask the residents of these agencies, what do you want? What will be feasible? So we did a photo voice project uh, where we entrust people with cameras to record their everyday lives and then to come and have dialogues about their lived experiences with physical health issues. Uh, And it created a great opportunity for us to hear from the people that we want to serve, the people that we want to help, what do they want out of the services and use that information to then develop interventions. And this is our trajectory of projects that we have. I'll, I'll talk a little bit. Of it. And photo voice was, is a wonderful methodology. It's hard to do, but if you get the right group of people um, and you and you get the, the right engagement of people, you're going to learn an enormous amount. Uh, and we did this at two housing agencies so where uh, each group had six weeks. Every week they took photos of things and then they came in a dialogue to talk about what they're learning and to share their experiences. And what we learned from this were many things. First of all, the residents didn't want a professional. Don't bring a doctor to tell me how to lose weight. Bring me a person who struggles with serious mental illness and obesity. Use peer, peer-based approaches. Someone who has walked the walk should be the delivering this intervention. The content of the intervention, we want to learn about weight loss. We want to increase our physical activity. We see it all around, yet we don't have opportunities to bring those interventions here. And then don't lecture us. Uh, we want to make sure that we're learning by experiential learning, skills acquisition. How do you eat better? How do you exercise if, if you live in a very tough neighborhood? How do you shop for food when you don't have enough money? Uh, uh, I have financial restraints of that. So this helped us really understand, okay, this is what will be salient for this population. Then let's find an evidence-based approach that fits with this and adapt it to that. And that's sort of what we did with this. And this participatory method also enabled us to develop the connection with our community partners because uh, we were honoring uh, the voices of the individuals we were working with. So... We ended up, uh, there's great interventions for obesity and, uh, and for uh, addressing diabetes. We took the, gra- the group Lifestyle Balance, which is based out of the Diabetes Prevention Program. We worked with the University of Pittsburgh uh, and adapted it to peer, uh, peer-led peer group Lifestyle Balance. This is achieving a healthy balance through healthy eating and physical activity, using a lot of behavioral skills and techniques. We trained peer specialists. We actually were the first one to actually uh, do this with peer specialists in a mental health setting. This is a long intervention. This is a 12-month intervention, 12-weekly course session, four bi-weekly transition session, six maintenance session. This is a long haul for people. Uh, And then we did quite a lot of adaptations uh, to make it uh, for supportive housing people with serious mental illness. Uh, that adaptation was actually supported by the provost office here at Columbia University, which was very helpful for us to do that. And then we uh, submitted a grant and we got funded to do a hybrid type one study, which is the main outcome is to examine the effectiveness, test whether this intervention is better than usual care, and then examine the implementation elements. How does this actually work and got implemented in these supported housing agencies? We call this the peer-led healthy lifestyle pro in supported housing. It's an R1 um, type one. 12 months, uh, we had three sites, two in Philadelphia, one in New York City. 
We recruited 314 individuals, adults with serious mental illness who were overweight and obese. 82% uh, of, of that sample was from racial and ethnic minority status, mostly black. And, and NIMH did something here which was very helpful where they wanted their outcomes to be clinically significant, not statistically significant. So for uh, in a sense that we achieve a clinical significant weight loss, that's 5% uh, uh, reduction of your waste from baseline. And then we added uh, secondary outcomes, there was clinical, clinical significant improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness. And we did this in a six minute walking test. And the idea is that every time you take the test, if you increase 50 meters, uh, in that test, you're, you're getting an imp a clinical imp improvement in your cardio cardiorespiratory fitness. And then you put those two things together, and it's a clinical reduction of your cardiovascular disease risk. Did this study five years, many ups and downs. This is what happened. No findings. Uh, although a larger proportion of our PGLB participants achieved these outcomes slightly, none of them were statistically significant both usual care and the intervention improved over time. Uh, so it's like, oh no, what happened here? So we had a great publication uh, about this. There's many reasons for that, but I wanna highlight a couple of things on this. One, the reason we had this no finding wasn't because our intervention didn't work. Our intervention actually worked. When we compare our intervention, which is peer-based, with professional interventions in this population, we're achieving very similar outcomes in terms of clinical significant weight loss and clinical significant reduction in cardiovascular disease risk. And in fact, our intervention is 12 months. Uh, the ACHIEVE intervention, which is the premier intervention by Gail Dama at John Hopkins, was a wonderful intervention, is 18 months. Uh, so we're achieving outcomes similar to hers. And then INSHAPE is a physical health activity intervention by Steve Bartell and the group at Dartmouth, he's now at Harvard, and we, we are replicating some of those work as well in terms of our outcomes. So we're finding that it's not our intervention that's not working. In many ways, our usual care work as well, and I'll tell you why that in, in a minute. Um, but one thing that we learned from this is that peer specialists can do this. Peer specialists, and this is a, actually a paper from one of our former doctoral students here at Columbia University, Lauren Bochicho, and, uh, and my big partner here at Columbia as well, Anna Stefancic, who really teased out what is it that the peer specialist provided uh, for this, that they not only had the lived experience of the inter of serious mental illness, but in our training, we made them go through our intervention. So peer specialists also could relate with our clients and our participants, what is it, the struggles that you have when you're trying to change your diet and physical activity, that support and that motivation was really important. Since this was a hybrid, so we learned a lot about how to work with peer specialists and not only how to train them, but also supervise them and actually a, a make them integrated into the workforce of this agency. So if we've learned about what we need to do uh, with peer specialists and, and, and how to maximize the great work that they're doing. But as a hybrid time one inter, uh, trial, we get an opportunity to also look under the hood and actually see what's happening in our sites. So one of the things that we did is that we examine our outcomes by site as well. So in 10 to 3 analysis, we put all the sites together, no findings. When we start seeing does this work in one site or another, we identify that there's one site where this really did work, and it did work very well uh, compared to usual care. So then it's like, what happened here? Why? And thank God, uh, and this is right. Uh, this is before the actual. I wrote this in the spring when we COVID hit. Like we had this meeting, we were publishing, we were uh, developing this paper. We had this finding. We needed to write a grant to examine the site differences. Uh, so we use this great methodology called the matrix, uh, the, mul the matrix multiple case study methodology developed by Bo Kim, uh, which is basically a mixed method approach where you're doing a case study of each of your intervention sites and examining factors that could influence your outcomes and your implementation and begin to compare. Of course, we have a very small sample. We only have three sites. We can just look at patterns here, but something began to emerge from our data. One of it is that the site that did this best, everyone did this with high levels of fidelity, but the site that did this best had the highest levels of fidelity. I mean, the, the peer specialists were doing uh, the intervention very well. Everyone was satisfied with PGLB, with our intervention, and that was common across all sites. Uh, the site that did better 
had a little bit less satisfaction with usual care, although site two also had the same type of, uh, of low satisfaction. But the big change here is the site where this worked best had not integrated physical healthcare into their services like what had happened in the other sites. In fact, site one, uh, which is one of the better performing sites, had written a SAMHSA grant, got it, and integrated physical health services into their operations while they're doing my study, which is wonderful. We want that. We love that. But my study got destroyed because of that. And that's okay. Uh, and, but we're learning that that level of high integration was important. The second side was starting to integrate health services. The third side didn't. So what we're learning is that PDLB may work better where it is relative, there's a relative advantage to usual care, where it's something new, where these services are not usually delivered, uh, and PGLB can provide an extra level of support, and it's different than usual care. It adds something uh, uh, to that component. So what we're finding is that PGLB is one of the interventions that you can use, and in my work in certain settings, not another, particularly if you have an integrated physical services as well. Uh, so we're, we have this under review. We'll see what happens with this. Um, but it's helping us understand where this intervention might work. And that hybrid design helped us develop this. All on top of this randomized controlled trial, we had done a longitudinal qualitative study where we, we were interviewing providers, administrators before we intervene, and then providers, administrators, and, and, and clients after the end of our trial to see what change over time came you know, qualitatively. And we saw this, this component. But as we're moving forward, because I know we, we, we need to end like 5.45, 5.30, yeah. That. So this really put me uh, to think about many of these individuals were middle-aged, like Carla. Uh, and by the time that they're part of our intervention, these chronic, these chronic medical illnesses have been set. They're already there. Why are we not doing anything to prevent people from having this? So we moved, we're moving right now towards prevention. And let me give you a story of Enrique. Um, Enrique was in his mid twenties when we met him. Um, he uh, uh, is an Afro Caribbean. Uh, his mother was black, and his father was a Dominican Republic who diagnosed with schizophrenia early in his twenties uh, after a series of psychotic episodes. Each psychotic episode led to hospitalization, and he got exposed to antipsychotic medications which were very helpful to addressing uh, the, uh, the voices in his head and the suicidal thoughts that he was feeling. But by the time we met, he was starting to get very concerned because he had gained a lot of weight. And he had just learned that his, uh, he was not only in the obese range, but his cholesterol was also high. So it's a 20-year-old uh, with history of diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease in his family. And the medicine that we're giving him to address the physical, the mental health component is impacting her physical. And this is how he puts his dilemma. This medicine, it cures you in one way, but it damages you in another. So he was very concerned about what am I going to do here? We're putting people in this sort of dilemma. In order to treat your mental illness, you need to sacrifice your physical health if you don't receive the right screening and the right treatment. What do we do with this? And a young person like that, basically what a psychiatrist is doing is monitoring and then sending them off to primary care not doing any type of actual managing, given that, and, and we do have treatment guidelines, as you will see, that actually engages people and, and actually shows that mental health providers can actually do something in this area. So we're right now looking into examining, and, and from the previous study, not only looking at the fragmentation and, and connecting care, but also including health behavior here. So combining these ideas of care coordination and also physical activity and healthy lifestyle. So a call to action is not just to screen and monitor, but intervene from the very beginning. And, and if you get an antipsychotic medication, you should get a lifetime intervention as well. You should be able to combine those two things. And when we looked at this literature, early psychosis is a critical period for addressing the emergent cardiometab cardiometabolic risk for young people. There's a lot of indication here that people are gaining weight. Uh, they're worsening their metabolic indicator, particularly if you're from a minority community that have already high risk of diabetes and hypertension. This kicks it to a whole level if you're not being uh, treated. There's also high rates of smoking in this population, which is the number one killer for cardiovascular disease. And there are interventions out there that are trying to address this. So with Anna Stefancic uh, in, at the Psychiatric Institute here, 
we decided to uh, partner with Coordinate Specialty Care. This is services in the United States that are providing first episode psychosis for this population. It's a multidisciplinary team approach. It's recovery oriented, addresses shared decision making. There's 260 clinics across 49 states using some type of model uh, of, of Coordinate Specialty Care. In New York City, we call it on track. Uh, and it emphasizes the individual needs and preferences. So what we have right now, we're developing, we're adapting an intervention that was developed in Australia called Keep the Body in Mind for young people with early psychosis that has health coordination, care coordination, focuses on in health promotion, healthy lifestyle, access to free tobacco cessation, have a peer support model for health promotion, uh, and then engage people uh, in this type of work. And uh, uh, we have an R34 that just got scored and it's looking like it's going to go there. We're still praying to the saints and burning candles. Hopefully we'll get there, uh, but it's looking good. And it will be a, a good intervention that we can embed within an existing uh, uh, system of care for these individuals and bring that component into it. So we're going to test it uh, uh, with the community using the collaborative intervention uh, framing approach. Uh, and then test it with, uh, in this community. So we're very excited about this, that next generation of studies. And as I was saying, this is what any young person needs to receive when they get exposed to an antipsychotic medication. This has been here since, when is it, 2011. We've known about this comprehensive cardiometabolic health that every young person should receive. Uh, and many few people get this. This is an instance of we know what to do, but we need to shift the focus of care to include and value health promotion. We shouldn't be putting people in psychosis in this dilemma that in order to get good mental health, you need to sacrifice your physical illness and we can do better. So this uh, keeping the body, uh, body in mind comes from uh, Australia. It's a wonderful intervention that Jackie Curtis uh, has developed and we're gonna adapt it to the realities uh, of, of, uh, of New York City uh, and on track New York and hopefully test it with this. So we're very excited to see this work. And globally, there are a lot of people working in this area as well. This intervention was also adapted to the United Kingdom, and it has shown some interesting results, not only on the physical health side, but also on the mental health side. Young people with psychosis are looking for gaining control over their bodies, to finding something to make them feel like they can sort of, uh, recover from that psychosis, but also not damage their body. And this intervention helps address those components. So I want to end with the elephant in the room. We've talked about serious mental illness. And one component here, one of the major uh, components that we see is stigma. It's the stigmatization that people with serious mental illness face in the medical system is a major problem that interacts and impacts the type of care that, that people receive. Uh, and, this thing, and I'm not talking about public stigma. I'm talking about stigma of from the providers themselves, from healthcare providers, uh, as people are trying to connect to primary care or other healthcare services. And I've done some work, as Anna has indicated, on depression literacy and anti-stigma interventions for Latino uh, on depression. But we wanted to bring this uh, more to the thing. And I know there's experts in, in, in Zoom as well here that know what stigma is. But one of the things I want to highlight is that stigma is supposed universal. Every culture stigmatizes the other in some way or other. But the way we go about doing that is very culture specific. And there's very specific elements that come into play. So we need to pay attention to that component. And in people with serious mental illness, this happens to people. This is called diagnosis. Uh, Diagnostic overshadowing. This is an example of someone who, when we ask Marcos, a person with schizophrenia, to talk about a negative healthcare experience, this is what he told us. One time it happened in the in the hospital. My stomach hurt. I kept telling them, but they just gave me a Tylenol. I ended up passing out. It was my appendix. They just didn't believe me. So doctors and and I'm not and doctors are not doing this maliciously. It's this idea that once you get a, a serious mental illness, and you see it in the chart, you start questioning whether the physical health complaints of that client are real or not. Is this part of their psychosis or is this a real medical condition? And there's this element of di diagnostic overshadowing where uh, if you're not aware of the physical, of the mental health issues and don't know the realities, uh, the physical health, the mental health concern overshadow the physical health issues and people don't get them the right type of care that they need in that time. 
We also know that stigma is a fundamental cause of health inequity. It permeates through the entire healthcare system, uh, from lack of investment in public mental health to mistrust, discrimination all over. So stigma is an important component that we need to target uh, as a way of improving care. So as life has it, uh, uh, we need to crush stigma in many ways, and I want to move forward so we can get into questions. Uh, uh, several years ago, uh, um, uh, 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 early career faculty, Elio Rivera Segarra from Ponte Health Institute in Puerto Rico, had written this wonderful paper on looking at stigma among Puerto Ricans with serious mental illness and identifying how stigma not only impacted the mental health care, but also the physical health care. Uh, and he wrote this beautiful paper about how primary care physicians are blaming patients for uh, their thing, the inability to recover, communication difficulties, and then the similar experience of diagnostic overshadowing. Uh, so Elliot decided to uh, look also, we, we connected because of our shared interest, and he's now taking our Bridges to Better Healthcare intervention and adding a component of stigma for primary care providers. And the cool thing that he's doing is he created these beautiful videos that show different interactions. We're gonna train primary care providers to examine different interactions, one that's stigmatized and one that's not, train them on how to have better intervention, better interaction with clients, record some of those sessions and provide them feedback about how to best communicate and do assessments uh, with a person with serious mental illness. And fascinating work that they're doing in Puerto Rico on this is our, our young, hungry people are looking for developing better science for the island and really improving the healthcare uh, of this population. So we have a project where we are adapting this intervention and we've put together a large uh, a large R1 to test the effectiveness of, uh, of this intervention, including sort of our healthcare manager with this module uh, around uh, the stigmatizing uh, component. And, and we'll see uh, how that improved, because that's one part that our intervention didn't do. We didn't intervene with the primary care physicians uh, at all. We connected people to care, but we didn't do anything with the primary care physicians. So we're really excited to see how that will go. Um, and the, the these videos are wonderful. Uh, they, they It's an incredible production. Uh, well, they have, and we're doing this in the southern part of Puerto Rico that has been hit very hard, not only by Maria, but the earthquakes. Uh, as well as all the disruptions that happen in our government. Uh, so we're looking at places where we have lots of under-resources uh, and helping connect people with care uh, is a major component of what we're trying to do. So I've come to the end of this. Uh, uh, the four areas that we want to do is integrated models of care should be the norm of the exception. Uh, as I mentioned, we need to move beyond the clinic walls. Uh, we need to focus on prevention. And then this last part, which is not part of the book, it's new work that came out around the stigma components and how that comes together. And I'm very excited to see this work come together and see the next generations of studies. Uh, there's great people in this field doing this work. And I think it'll be uh, very interesting to see how this is moving forward. And hopefully we can make a dent in reducing uh, early mortality in people with serious mental illness. We need that to address this inequity. Uh, and I wanna end with a quote uh, from one of my dear colleagues at Washington University, Vera Thompson, uh, who really encapsulated, I think, where our field needs to go. And not only the work that we do, but our field in general and social work, that to achieve equity, we must be willing to intervene directly on the social determinants and the practices and policy that sustain the systems of inequity. Uh, and it is that type of work that we need to continue to be. We need to uh, uh, be training the next generation of social workers to address this component, to look at these interventions and really address the social determinants and examine those components as we move forward. Uh, so in the end, if you're more interested about this work, uh, I was very lucky to be selected to be part of this translational science benefit model. They created a case study. Uh, this is developed by Doc Luke. Uh, this is part of the uh, Implementation Research Institute. And Doc Luke has a, a wonderful center. And this is a new way of actually communicating our science, of, uh, of uh, documenting the impact that our science has in different components, uh, in changing policy, changing practices, changing training. Uh, and they have a whole model of how they do this uh, with our work. And, and they're being able to sort of showcase this work. And it's a way of communicating beyond the academy, the work that we're doing to policymakers, community members, foundations, and stuff like that. So check this out. This it's, it's a wonderful. There's many case studies there, 
uh, from it. And actually, it's been interesting. Uh, we've been using this in the Implementation Research Institute to make a better argument for the, to the National Institute of Mental Health that our work is, uh, it is making an impact beyond grants and publications and, and really thinking how we're transforming healthcare and, and all uh, areas of care as well uh, with this. So it's a really interesting tool. Check it out. Uh, just a plug here for them uh, and uh, an important sort of component of this. So I will stop here and thank you for the opportunity. All right. So questions. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much, Leo. I'm such a huge fan of your work. And I remember when you showed me your tenure packet to use oh. as an example of mine. And I was like, good Lord, this is not, I'm not going to model mine after oh, yeah. I need to do a little bit more work quickly. Um, you're, you've just done so much and it's so impressive. I have a, one of my questions is kind of thinking along the, you started the problem with framing people with serious and persistent mental illness are not included in clinical trials. Yeah. And, and the reason for that is fidelity, yes. right? Like people are concerned with safety. a lot safety and fidelity, mm -hmm. safety, you know, whether there's contraindications, but even when there isn't like, will they show up? Yeah. Will they, will they participate fully in the intervention? Will they take all the medications they're supposed to, et cetera, et cetera? And I think that that ends up being an exclusion criteria for different types of treatments that could be very effective as well as this question of like, it's more, you know, you get harms associated with treatments when you don't take them at the right, right time and place. And I'm thinking of the GLP-1 medications mm -hmm. for obesity. Mm -hmm. And how, you know, you have this metabolic change that happens with people in antipsychotics, they gain a lot of weight, it's associated with all these chronic diseases. And I'm assuming that, that serious and persistent mental illness is a contraindication for those drugs because they're done by ejection once a week and you're supposed to do it on a, on a scheduled time. And I'm thinking about your peer support model and what you know, I do think it's incredibly important that you were able to get the same outcomes as usual care looks like when it's an integrated care model. But I'm wondering whether peer support models could be used to engage people in research mm -hmm. so that you can assure PIs of studies, you can ensure uh, IRBs and, and, you know, a clinical team that we can, uh, you know, if you let this person participate in the clinical trial, we can assign them a peer navigator yep. that can make sure that they um, participate fully in the, in the intervention, and that the same thing could be done for these treatments that require certain things to happen at a certain time. Yeah. Is that something you guys have given any thought to? So it's interesting that, that for the peer component to engage in research for sure. Like I think it's super important in this trial, uh, our peers especially were delivering the care. So, so the, the reason people stay with the intervention, we had great attendance as well. I didn't show the attendance data here. People stay with his intervention, and it was the peer specialist, that connection that they made to, to be able to participate in the intervention, to engage in it. So I think that's a really important component. We didn't, we didn't have peers in the research component, but in the studies that I've done, we always, we don't use peer specialists, but we use people from the community. Uh, so when they are engaging people in the research process, they are seeing someone that looks like them, that speaks like them, that comes from the same a background to help them engage. And that's been done. I mean, good people that do this type of work do that type of work, but that's this is an interesting uh, component as well. In terms of medications for, for engaging people in medication, I think that's an important area because peer specialists can provide you some of the connections that people might need um, to address some of the healthcare needs that they want and may, may be a good opportunity for doing that. The, the, you mentioned this, that SMI is usually an exclusionary criteria. You're totally right. For, for all the major clinical trials that we have for hypertension, for cholesterol, for diabetes, an, inclusion, an exclusion criteria was serious mental illness. And in fact, when we were doing this R01 um, or, or the call for this R01, I was invited uh, by multiple people and multiple uh, Ad, ad, advisory groups and advocate group to talk to the director of NIMH. A, and in that meeting, that's exactly what they did. They brought in every single key officer from NHLBI, NCI, NADDK, and showed the director of NIMH, look, we have all of these interventions that can help your population. None of them included people with serious mental illness. You need to invest in this type of work and have trials that where people with serious mental illness are not excluded with the right safeguards, with the right supports. 
uh, with the safety component. And that's where my the R1 that I got is part of a portfolio that came after that meeting around this type of component. And then there was another one after that for younger people, for young adults uh, to doing that. So I think there's a space for doing that and to building that trust that is needed. Uh, but they're not only the solution. You have to also have, uh, I think, peer space are important, but people also they trust that this is going to benefit the community, that then what, what's going to happen after the study ends? Is this service is going to continue? Uh, and I think those are important questions as well as we think of the science. Uh, I'm involved in a, I'm, I'm in a, the Data Safety Monitoring Board for the Decipher initiative that is a big initiative for an NHLBI, and it's the best trials. They have seven trials that they're in the process of doing. They're all around equity. And they're all around uh, engaging minoritized community. And it's been fascinating to see how the seven teams around the country are working on the engagement of minoritized community in large effectiveness. Actually, these are large implementation trials. These are hybrid two or hybrid three, where they're testing, actually they're hybrid two, testing the intervention as well as implementation strategies of how to get these interventions into uh, outpatient mental services, primary care services, they're doing things with smoking cessation. There's different areas. So some institutes in NIH are already thinking that. And what's fascinating about that, uh, that initiative, it's almost a seven to 10 year grant that you're getting. So there's a, grant, a component of preparing for the RCT, then getting the grant vetted by multiple things and then doing the trial. And then they're gonna look at sustainability at the end. So they're, they're shifting the paradigm uh, in how to do that component. So it's been interesting. So yes. Good to see you, Heidi. <laughs> Good question. I oh. have some questions, but are there any questions within uh, the audience now? Uh, Louisa, were you about to? Yeah, sure. No, I mean, this. Uh, thank you so much. Professor it's so great Louis. to have you back and, and hearing about your work. Um, the In terms of the peer labor force and how we're supporting it, and we've seen in the substance use treatment field, it, they they have played such an increasing role. Yeah. What are we doing in terms of all the training, support, pathway to a career, pathway to stability for the peers, and to keep you know what what do you think is needed as, as a call to action yeah. to support uh, sort of the training, capacity building, career pathways, stability. Yeah for peers because yeah. I mean, we're just seeing just a huge increase. That's right. Uh, so yeah. We learned, it was fascinating. We learned a lot uh, during this trial of things that we did not expect. So one component for the peer work for, they need to have competitive salaries because usually sadly to say there's a lot of peers especially, but the reason they're being uh, included in, in many programs is because you can pay a lower salary. They're not professional. Well, in, in a sense they are in many ways. So we need to have competitive salaries that are competitive at the levels of social workers and, and, and others as well. So that's one component. One thing that we learned is not only how to train them, which was wonderful and stuff like that, but how do we supervise and how do we engage them as a workforce within these agencies? All of these supportive housing agencies were all for peer specialists, but we had a lot of trouble on the engagement of that workforce with the other clinicians. Uh, so we ended up actually having to train the clinicians on how to work with peer specialists and engage them as a true partner in the clinical work, not as this other person that's there. Uh, so we had to do quite a lot of training for the providers, for the professional providers, uh, the psychiatrists, the social worker, on how do you share that responsibility and that value that the peer specialists bring and that integration. Into it. And then we, we learned some lessons uh, that we need. We, if we do this again, we definitely need to have a better understanding of, of a, uh, we now have a better understanding of how to assess the context of that clinic and make sure that the right policies and practices support. The other thing that we learned is that like any other professional, they wanna advance into this component. So we gave them opportunities to come together uh, to, uh, to connect with other peer specialists in Philadelphia and New York State, uh, engage them in our publication, engage them in, in, in our presentation. So they're getting professional skills that they could take into other jobs and other things. So the professional development uh, of that, but we don't want to turn them into professional, into clinicians in a sense. They, they, it's a different, it's, it's a tough balance to break between that. And, and in the peer specialist world that we were involved in, there's this, this tension 
Like if we go to professional, then they become social workers. Okay. Uh, and that's okay. I think that, they, and some do. And I think lift experiences, there are people with lift experiences who are clinicians uh, that just many people hide that uh, in our clinical work because of the stigma that happens uh, uh, within that. So I think with the, we have to think through about how, what this workforce means, how to provide them better opportunities to advance, uh, but without losing the peer component. Uh, of it, like how, and that, and I, I don't think we have an answer to that yet. We we we're trying to balance that, but it's been difficult to do. So I think there's there those components we find in a sense uh, for that. Uh, but one thing that has happened over the year is that in some places, in mental health clinics, some of them, depending on the state, if you're certified peer specialist, you can then get Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, so there's a line of of of, of of payment here for now. So that I think will engage the workforce. There's also a lot of variability on the training. Uh, that happen. Every state has a different certification. Every city has a different type of component. So we need to have some level of uh, of, uh, of standardization uh, of that. We were very lucky to be in New York and in Pennsylvania, where there's great uh, certification process for them, um, and 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 there's there's sort of a training component, a basis training component that then we can build from there uh, for that. But but yeah, I think uh, there's much to do there. Yeah. Oh, Professor. <laughs> Hi, uh, it's so inspiring and, and it's making me think big. And and as far as thinking big, so thank you. Uh, and I know you're a big thinker and you're inspiring. So in thinking big, you know, a 13 to 30 year old, 30 years of mortality gap is a pretty big gap. Um, so is your sense to try to chip away the, the success to, to, to approach is to like chip away at that and you know reduce it to 29 years? 28 years, 27, or something more like profound and like a big tipping point change. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, which of your strategies are more sort of incremental and which of your call to actions might have like a bigger tipping point effect? That's a, I, thank you for that question, Owen, because I think that, and, and I love that you're pushing us to think bigger because you're also a big thinker on this. So uh, I, to me, where I'm, I get more excited and I can see where we're going to tip, it's in the prevention um, that hoping an individual, um, when they are a bit exposed to antipsychotic medication and beginning that treatment, that's the point. That's the critical area where we can set out someone in the path for better health than for chronic illness. So that's what that I think is where we are. But that will take a while, right? That uh, we need to implement that within uh, clinics. Not everyone has coordinated specialty care, uh, so that we need to uh, figure out how to create services at that time. And it's a shift in psychiatry. Uh, psychiatry had known about all of these components uh, for more than 20 years. These guidelines are there. Very few people use it and apply them. Uh, so, but we need to do more than just apply clinical guidelines of screening and monitoring. We need to intervene. The other thing is that I think there's an, we're missing an opportunity that if we address the health promotion and set people on a rise, on a, on a path of health promotion early in their psychosis, we may also be improving their, uh, their mental health uh, and setting them on a path of recovery faster uh, in, in a more holistic component. So I think that's where I see some, some, some component if we're gonna address that. We still need to do the work with people who already have diabetes, that already have, uh, and, that, that, and, and we need to do that. The other big one is smoking. This is a population that continue to smoke cigarettes way too much and smoking is the number one killer here and psychiatry now is beginning to really look at, at smoking and being able to provide smoking cessation from the very beginning and helping people uh, there was this uh, misconception in psychiatry that uh, people with serious mental illness did not want to quit smoking that's not true people do want to quit smoking they know this is bad for them they need help and that's a big addiction uh, to do. So I think smoking cessation is another component and embedded it throughout the entire mental health system. In fact, the last places to be smoke-free were psychiatric units. Um, so, so we have structural forces here as well. Uh, and, and that's moving in the right direction, don't get me wrong, uh, but we need to do a better job. Uh, that. And even where people are living, people with serious mental illness you know, live, they are living in places that have lots of, of places to buy uh, uh, cigarettes. They're like surrounded by this and they're being advertised directly to that population. Uh, so we need to, that's another one. Like at the end of the day of all these, of the cardiovascular risk factors, smoking is one that could make a huge difference if we 
decrease in the rates of smoking. Uh, and we can do harm reduction approaches uh, to help someone with, uh, with that type of thing. So those are the two things that I would say to think big uh, as we're putting, that, uh, putting this together uh, for that, yeah. Um, I actually, I have so many questions, but I'm going to integrate one of my questions with a question that was submitted online previously when your amazing talk was advertised. And the question has to do with cultural competency. Mm -hmm. You did talk about that. So in what way do you think that cultural competency, uh, competency plays a role in some of the treatment outcomes or lack thereof? Yeah. So I, I, cultural competent, I, I have a, I don't like that term because <laughs> I don't think we're never going to be comp competent on anything. It more the cultural sort of uh, humility, but the idea that I think what I've learned over the years, and this is actually a testament to Roberto Luis Fernandez work uh, of really bringing culture to the surface, to make it explicit. Culture sort of is all around us, like the air that we breathe. It's here, but we don't say it, we don't name it. And in our intervention, we're trying to make it very explicit so that we can then address these issues and train social workers uh, on how to be more culturally, uh, uh, culturally uh, relevant and appropriate in what they're trying to do. Uh, so, for example, in our work, that, that cultural formulation interview is to ask about those stories, to ask clients to tell us what do they think about uh, when, uh, the, the diabetes, what do they, their thoughts, their exploratory models, that's really important clinical information that can then help us connect. Uh, and then, the, as I mentioned, the mere act of asking someone to tell me their story, it's, uh, it's very opening for, for, for kind of particularly in our healthcare system, where people get 10, 15 minutes with their primary care physician, and nobody asks them about those. So, so I think bringing those elements, there's also the cultural, the professional culture side of things. One of the things that we've done in our work is to shift the professional culture of mental health. That one of the things that we were finding in, in early in our work is that mental health professionals will say, well, physical health is not what we do. That's someone else's responsibility. So we also need to shift the professional culture. I know this is the whole person. And if we're providing medications and treatment that impact your physical health, we need, we're responsible for that as well. So how do we help and shift the, the professional culture uh, as well to focus on physical health pieces. But there's much to do here, for sure. Um, we train, we try to manualize it. I think we, we train our, our, our social workers in that, in that particular trial to be very respectful, to use, you know, to, uh, uh, for the Latino culture to, uh, you know, talk about senora, senora, last names, be very respectful, uh, be open to this cause. Let's talk about your family, get to know the person uh, beyond sort of being a patient. And that, that shows, uh, that you're respecting someone and bringing the humanity into our healthcare system that many of, of, of our clients are, are, are missing. Uh, and, the, and I think our providers can do that. We just need the space for that. So those are some of the components. There's all the things that we've done around uh, in, the, in the mental health literacy world around how we communicate mental health to our, to our Latino population in particular uh, and how to do it in a way that, that is appropriate. So we're using entertainment education approaches uh, using soap operas and uh, photonovelas and things like that to engage people. Uh, we're doing, I'm, I'm now involved in a project where we're looking at Spanish language media and how those are Spanish language media in the United States is communicating around issues of psychosis and schizophrenia. And it's extremely troublesome. Uh, of the, uh, every schizophrenia is linked to violence, similar to what we see in the English, in the English media, but there's been very little work being done in analyzing Spanish language media. Uh, and Spanish language media is very powerful for our community. That's where people are getting information about health, mental health, and other things. But we were very shocked that only there's, we were able to find one study in the U.S. that had actually examined Spanish language media and several in Spain and Chile. And we just found a study in Peru uh, around this. And, and the, the role that media plays in stigmatizing uh, that population. So I think there's there are elements to do. And... I think that's an opportunity to improve the way that we talk about mental illness in our community uh, so that we can focus on recovering positive stories um, and, and then provide people um, options of where to seek care. Like one of the things that we're finding, many of the stories do not tell people at the end of the story, where do you go to seek help? So you talk about sort of a suicide of someone and then not around, okay, if you're feeling suicidal, where do you go talk? We're not seeing that in the Spanish language media. So, yeah. 
your comments raise so many more questions for me, oh. but um, I, I, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but one of the things I did want to um, ask you about related to cultural competency, I was struck by so many of your findings, but one of them had to do with the word confianza. Uh -huh. So in Spanish, it's, 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 it's not only hope, yeah. it's having a relationship of trust. Yeah. So you would confide certain things only in confianza. And so related to that question about cultural competency, did was that something that surprised you when you saw that it was one of the central Component. elements? I see. Yeah. It, it wasn't surprising, but it was important to hear people say that in confianza. And you're correct. It's not only hope. It is around trusting someone. And in the book, we talk about an instance where a person goes to the healthcare manager and confides on the healthcare manager something that this person was hiding from their family, from their doctor and their psychiatrist. And it was because they had formed that relationship. And in that case, it was actually a medical condition that if you, if you wouldn't have gotten uh, identified at time, that person would have ended up uh, in the emergency and, and probably it was serious physical health issue. That person was feeling, was having actually a, a procedure. The procedure had gone uh, not wrong, but having side effects and had not confided to anyone and had confided to the healthcare manager. So it's opening that door that they have someone that they can trust that they can then help uh, um, connect them to the right care and be able not only to, to confine them, but that to accept the help that they that they want to provide. So I think that was really important. And, and that was to the testament. I don't think there's a, Evidence-based practice a testament to the relationship that people are forming. I mean, this is this is a good therapist is creating that trust, that confiance is really important in that component. And if you have it in difficult situations, that might be helpful uh, to help the individual. So it'd be interesting to see how that happened, right? And that we don't have information, but it'd be interesting to see that component uh, to care. But I, but I think it's really important. Yeah. Um. I can can I ask one more question about <laughs> taking the yeah. chair's prerogative here as the moderator. I um I also was hoping you could comment a little bit more in whichever way you like. So you started your talk, you said I'm a Puerto Rican social worker. Yeah. And the amazing work that you've done with social workers, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the field of social work. And we know that in a few years time, there's going to be a severe shortage of social workers. So if you could comment a little bit more about the promise of social work mm. in for students that might be listening or yeah. others, um, maybe just briefly. Yeah, and no, no. I know Dean Begg has a few <laughs> closing that, that, comments. That, that, no, no, no. So no, I, to me, I think Social workers are extremely important. But in the mental health field where I have worked most of my career, we are the ones delivering the care. We are the ones out in the community working with this community. So I think the field uh, uh, needs to continue to grow uh, in this component. And that this is a career that is a profession that has good science. You know, we need to continue to build the science of social work. And I believe there is a science of social work and, and marriage that with the equity, the social justice component. That's how I've got, I originally wanted to be a psychologist until I met a social worker. <laughs> and then I worked with a social worker and said, like, no, 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 that's the way to go. Because we're paying attention to social issues, the person in the environment, but we're also thinking about that our science needs to make a difference. And I think that, and, and not that psychology doesn't, there's all the public health as well, colleagues are doing that, but social work brings us perspective that I think is important and we need to own it. Um, I, I see the value that social workers bring when we are in study sections in NIH and the science that we're making and, what, and the community uh, component and, and the attention to social determinants of health uh, is important, the attention to poverty. Uh, uh, and we were talking about this earlier today. We don't do a good job about telling the story and the history of social work and the value that social workers has had to play to policies in the United States. I was just talking to Michael Sherrard about this, about we have a whole history of shifting policy in this country uh, and our social services and social workers are the leader, uh, have been leaders of that. We need to continue to tell that story. So this is an area where I think there's a lot of hope. I hope our, our, uh, our students see this as a career 
that has a future. And if you want to make a difference, this is a career that can make a difference in this. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, to see. I do see those numbers going down, the, but but I'm hopeful. At the end of the day, I think I'm an optimistic person in one way or another. Uh, that, that that do and then the science behind it. I think we can we have to continue to build the science of our work uh, and test our interventions and, and and claim our intervention. These are intervention developed by social workers for social workers uh, and and building that science compared to other uh, uh, areas. And and I think we we will do that. I, but but there's more to do there. Yeah. So hopefully. thank you so much. <laughs> I know Dean Beg has a few words. Thank you again for this episode. No, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, Anna, thank you for the expert moderating. And um, Leo, it was a tour de force. Oh, thank you. Really, that was a spectacular talk. And um, I learned so much. And what really struck me, or a lot of things struck me, but one thing I will definitely take from this, uh, you know, if you think of a continuum of holistic care to really limited, almost blinded, you need dimensional care. I don't think I've ever seen such extreme examples of that in, in what you've presented. And it rings so true in the context of what of your work. And I just want to thank you for, for your extraordinary efforts in, in that domain. And, and thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Yeah. No, and thank you so great. much for the opportunity to, to be here. <laughs>